Now we're going to talk about the law of octaves. And I found this picture and I was pretty pumped about it because, you know, you got seven bodies all, you know, unfolding there. You got the uh, electromagnetic uh, spectrum, you know, so the whole thing's pretty interesting. But the law of octaves is basically represented there, basically. This, this is an agnostic picture, so, but it's a, it's a pretty good one. So, and like I said, entropy and octaves are, coincide really well. That's why I put them together. So everything in the universe is ruled by cycles. Since the student does not yet possess a permanent center of gravity, they are ruled by the cycles of psychological days and nights. And now we have a handle on what a psychological night is. And by understanding that, we know what a day is also. During a psychological day, the work is easy and fulfilling. Experiences come. We are helped by the masters of the White Lodge, like we talked about. During a psychological night, the work becomes much more difficult. We feel lazy and disinterested in the work. Experiences cease and we feel unattached to the teachings. Kind of a reiteration of what's been said. The work on the of the path is like the notes of the musical scale. This is why it's called the law of octaves. <clears throat> Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. We all know them, seven notes. When the work is begun, we start from Do. This represents Do. With activity, the scale rises, re, mi, etc. Once you reach T, an additional effort must be made in order to rise to the next octave so that the work can repeat. If no extra effort is made, Entropy sets in and pulls us backwards down the scale back to our starting point. Okay, so it seems it's a little abstract right now because we're talking about do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, and stuff. But the notes of the scale represent advancement on the Gnostic path. That's what we're talking about by do, re, mi, fa. It's like saying you start to have uh, lucid dreams and then you wake up in your dreams and then you get the process of unfoldment. These are these are. You know, this is do, re, mi, kind of like step one, two, three along the path. And then we have to apply effort, or else we go back down to not waking up in our dreams, not having lucid dreams, and, and that kind of thing. So they represent a series of events. The notes represent a series of events. A pause in progress occurs after do, re, mi, and another one after fa, so, la. This is according to some, of course. A greater pause occurs after t. During a pause, we must apply a special shock to push us through to the next interval. A greater shock is needed to push us through to a higher octave. So does it make sense how we're using the musical notes and the scale to represent our, our, our progress on the path? So we're, like, we're not really taught, like, you wouldn't be able to really measure it out, I don't think, if you try to get all scientific. Oh, right now I'm at Do, so if I have another astral experience, I'm at Re. If I have another one, I'll be at Mi and then I'll uh, have to put extra effort. Like, you're not going to be able to judge it at that, you know, you're not going to be able to get the microscope of that on it, but it, this is how the path generally goes, kind of progress, 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 pause. If we don't work at the pause, uh, we go backwards. If we do work, we go progress, 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 plateau, another pause. If we don't work harder or change it up, back down the scale. The shock is, the shock is applied willpower and greater efforts. If we do not apply a shock, entropy will set in and begin to drag us back down the scale once again. So I mean, this is the whole idea of entropy. It is crucial to recognize the pauses and to immediately apply the special shock. So to recognize the pauses, I'm not talking about realizing you're at do, re, or me, but realizing when you've plateaued, or you've sort of stopped doing the work, you're not having as much success, and it seems like it's not as important to you, once you get to that point, you have to recognize you're at that point. And you have to know that if you don't do something drastic, if you don't apply the shock of willpower or extra effort, that you're going to start getting dragged back backwards by entropy. You're going to start losing ground. So the shock is, again, changing the meditations, the runes, and alchemy. Alchemy is a big one, too. We're going to talk a little bit more about alchemy in this lecture also. So, for example, this is what we're talking about. You got your do, re, mi. So, do, re, mi equals a series of events on the path, whatever it is. We can use astral projection as, like, you know, the example. Like, okay, um, you're remembering your dreams. You know, you're writing down your, your dreams in your dream diary. Now you're remembering all your dreams, and now you're starting to have more vivid dreams. And then there's a pause or a shock needed for an ascent. So, let's say, okay, 
the dream diary is working. I'm starting to remember my dreams. Now I need to start mantralizing, start doing a hip tone so I can become more conscious. Start <coughs> concentrating. So you, you, you know, you start doing a hip toe or you start doing fara on or lara s. If no shock is applied, you'll start going back to, backwards down to not remembering your dreams, not writing them down, and <coughs> back to your starting point. But if you do apply a shock, you're going to send, you're going to send to the next one. So now you got fa, so, la. This is the next series of events. So now let's say that it's a conscious uh, waking up in your dream. And you wake up in your dream and now you're consciously awake in your dream. And the next one is, say, you feel the process of unfoldment. So you feel yourself actually come out of your body. And maybe the next one is you have a longer astral experience that seems to last longer than any one you've had before. Well, then you're going to hit another pause. And another shock is needed. Because every time you pause, if you're standing still, if you're not changing it up, you're going to start going backwards. And then you have to, <coughs> sorry, you have to work harder to get back in, back to having these astral experiences. And it's close for any part of the work. It could be observing an eagle or working in alchemy, especially. It could, it could be the same for, for all those systems. So if there's no shock applied, then entropy sets in, and you get dragged back into a psychological night. Back to the beginning. you got to work again to get back up there. If you apply the shock, you go to the next one, T. Once T is reached, an additional shock is needed to rise the scale up to a higher octave. And then the cycle will repeat at a higher level. Same exact thing. So now you're at Do. This was Do. That's Do again. But now you're at a higher level. Maybe you're having frequent astral projections and you're not projecting as much ego in the astral plane, so you're starting to get more and more useful knowledge about what you should be doing on the path, say from your Divine Mother or your father who is in secret, or the masters of the White Lodge. Yes, my man. Does this imply that um, once you reach a new octave uh, that you cannot go down? No. Okay. Because the law of entropy will like always that. bring you down. Always. It's a constant, it's a constant struggle. If you reach the next octave and you're having conscious astral experiences all the time, and then you stop meditating, or if you, especially if you have a fall, you're going to go down. You're going to go down. Entropy is going to set in. Um, practice is the key. There is no secret, but there's a secret to be practiced. No one wants to hear that's a secret because that means you have to do a lot of work. <laughs> the secret is doing the practice. You must constantly be working in the three factors the birth, the death, and the sacrifice. The birth of your spiritual solar bodies. Solar, solar bodies. bodies. The death of. No. No. <laughs> and the sacrifice for humanity. Yes, see, that's what we're trying to drive into everybody, especially. This is what we're doing in Gnosis, this right here. Everything else defines it and adds to it, but that's, that's what's crucial. <clears throat> if we do not practice, a pause will lead to entropy, which will lead to an esoteric night. No matter if you're at the next octave or an octave above it, you stop the practices, you're going to have a pause, you're going to plateau, and if you're plateau and if you're static, you're going to start getting dragged back down, like an undertow, bringing you back down to your lowest common denominator. It's not like you practice really hard for three years and then just say, oh, all right, I'm there for another three years and I practice, yeah? At some point, uh, the concept was described to me that the plateau you're describing is essentially it's <clears throat> a test of, of our willpower, like mm -hmm. um, to see if we're actually worthy of progressing because... Uh, some people will only progress if they get results. Right. So the plateau is is a way of of uh, really testing if you're actually walking the path because of results or because you actually want. want yeah. It, right? yeah, absolutely. And uh, some of War talks about that a lot too. He talks about going through certain tests where he had to wait in a room and there was like 20 other people all waiting in the astral and they're waiting to get led into this big chamber and he was the only one that sat there patiently and everyone's getting frustrated and mad. And they had to wait for what seemed like forever. And then the doors open and they said, what do you possess that they don't? And he says, patience. And they let Samael in. And everybody else was turned away at the door. This is a specific astral experience for Samael on board. Wow. But this is demonstrating this same principle. Also, Rudolf Steiner talks a lot about this too. Because he talks about the plateau. And if we give up when we're plateauing, we don't perceive the spiritual world particularly. Because we're not like Samael on board. We're not awakened masters. So we don't perceive the astral, we don't perceive our divine beings, we don't know what, what's going on in the higher realms. And things can be going on, 
even though it feels like they're not for us. Our job is to keep our end of the bargain up by doing the practices, even if it means we're not seeing results or that we don't know truly what's going on. Maybe the Divine Mother and the Father who's in secret is suffering terribly for us and, and they're dragging us further along the path and we're not aware of it because we're not tapped into it. <coughs> you got to have the patience of Job, right? The last picture of Blake was a sacrifice of Job. You remember the story of Job, all the tests he got put through? Everything. So that's the idea. You're going to get put through tests, and it's not going to be a rosy path. But, thankfully, during a night, practice will lead to a new dawn. So if we're having a psychological night, the practice will lead to the new dawn. So a psychological day. The, the dawn doesn't have to last forever. We can start practicing. What we have to do is make the conscious choice to ascend rather than descend. <coughs> we must change our habits and routines, and we must decide to stick with the work, especially when it seems the hardest. Those three things are, are key. They're like three basic keys. Choose to ascend rather than descend, because now we know. Now we're armed with some more information. We know if we're not moving forward, we're not really just hanging out. We're actually moving backwards. Entropy's pulling us backwards. We have to choose to not fall victim to entry because we know about it now. We have to change our habits because obviously they're not working or we wouldn't have stalled out or become stale or become <coughs> complacent with it. And we have to decide to stick with the work. Say, no, okay, I'm doing this. I'm doing this all the way. I'm going to do the work even though right now it seems hardest. There's a new dawn coming. You have to have you know, a belief in that. And then when you push through and the new dawn comes, then you can have faith in that because now you've experienced it. Remember the difference between belief and faith from the other lectures. So, Tiny Tim's got a question. Uh, how long does an individual night last, and what consequences are there for those who prolong it? So we'll go a little straight to the top for the answer here. <laughs> from the main man. <laughs> Let's remember very well that esoterically, time does not exist. Time exists for each one of us according to our own activity or inactivity. This was from an actual question and answer from, from the Master Samael. <clears throat> what he's saying here is, a night can last for the whole life of the disciple in the same way that a day can last as long as we wish. The night can last for the entire life or the day can last for the entire life. It all depends on our own activity or inactivity. So that the whole thing depends on you. The choice is up to you. If, you. if you don't do the work, then you're choosing to have a psychological night now. Because now you know, there's more responsibility when we learn this stuff. Like they always say, it's, it's, it's worse for your karma to know this stuff and not do it than it is to have never heard of it. Because then you're ignorant and... It's, you know, it's, a, it's a shame for you. Well, kind of, it's bliss. It's a bliss. Kind of, yeah. But you're still going to be under the wheel, so I'm sorry. But now we know. <laughs> now we have a higher, you know, karmic responsibility to our being and to our divine mother and to our father to start working towards it. Because, you know, at the judgment, at the rapture, we'll say, hey, we get, you have the information. You just chose not to be active. And choosing not to be active is choosing to fall into entropy, choosing to fall into a psychological night. It might seem like we're not making a choice, but we are. Every day is a choice. Every time we don't do a practice, that's a choice. Every time we do do a practice, that's a choice. The choice is always up to us. It's always, the power is always in our own hands. Because that's a Gnostic path. It's up to each individual. No book of Psalm on War is going to save you just by reading it. You have to put it into practice in your daily life. You have to live it. And that's the biggest difference between Gnostic Christianity and, and traditional Christianity. The idea that a man lived 2,000 years ago, and he died, and now we're going to heaven. <coughs> this one says, he showed, he showed you a path, you have to walk it, and the choice is up to you whether you go to heaven or not, or whatever, you know? Descend or descend. Now we're going to talk about the law of octaves and alchemy, because it also applies to the alchemical practices. The alchemical practice, that's the sexual practice. Sexual practice, yeah, yeah exactly. If you're single, then you can't. Well, I mean, the, we still work with our energies when we're yeah. single. Someone else says, yeah, whether you have a partner or alone, you have to work with the energies. So the idea is that when you get, when you get to the right spot in the path, the, the opportunity will present itself as needed, that you'll be able to do this. So this work is important. 
In the Middle Ages, they had all kinds of great books on alchemy like this. It was great pictures like this. You see this guy's holding a staff with a snake with a crown on it, and he's looking at Hermes uh, with the symbol of Mercury there. This guy doesn't have the snake on his staff. I don't really know what the bird is, but you see he's shielding his eyes because he can't look at it. So it's kind of, they're kind of telling you these truths. And if you look at a lot of these different, you know, medieval alchemical texts like... Uh, um, the Rosary of the Philosophers, or the Twelve Keys of Basil, Val Basil Valentine. They have a lot of pictures, a lot of imagery. <coughs> it's always the sun, the moon, the mercury. It's always a, a two-headed androgynous being. There's all these snakes and cups and water and fountains. But after going through Gnosis, you're going to see that this is what they were talking about. This is what they were talking about. So we're going to get into alchemy a little bit. There's some chances also to have more alchemical lectures. Um, we're going to watch a video on it. There, there's a, so Alchemy 1 is a video um, put out by the Gnostic Teachings.org. Alchemy 2 is a lecture that will be put online, but Wolfgang generally didn't give it because, you know, it's kind of a touchy subject sometimes. We, it's like, oh, it feels weird sometimes telling people how to have sex, basically. But mm -hmm. uh, those lectures will present themselves and we can talk about it more or less depending on what you guys want to talk about. I mean, it's up to the group. When I was going through Phase C, there was just my brother and I. And so we had uh, Carlos for one lecture. He had a lecture. He said, well, let's shut it off. What do you guys want to talk about? I'm like, ah, let's talk about this alchemy stuff because, you know, it's just dudes here. And we can kind of get into the actual practice and talk about it plain English. And it was helpful. But, I mean, people react differently. So it, it's... It's an option. It's not necessary. The information will be online. You know? yeah, yeah. The information I want to know. I want to see if I have movie. the opportunity. <laughs> I know. I want to know what the heck to do and not miss yeah, the opportunity. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know? We, we well, just love it. Yeah. Yeah. There's specific <laughs> meditative practices you know, to do while you're connected. And we can, we can talk about that in the we future. Just like dirty old women. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. This is white sexual magic. White tantra. It's not dirty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good, it's pure sick. This is a classic little alchemical image, right? That's from the 12 Keys of Basil Val Val Valentine. Got the man on the sun, the woman on the moon, the dove, the Holy Spirit, you know, they got the cross, kind of like what the original Rosicrucian rose on the cross I means, the same kind of symbolism as that. <coughs> okay, so the law of octaves also applies to the practice of alchemy and the birth of the solar bodies. And now, we know, we know a lot of the terms, so alchemy, we know what that is. Arcanum, AZF, same thing. The Ninth Sphere is the same thing. The Forge of the Cyclops is the same thing. There's a lot of different terms because it's been represented a lot of different ways over a lot of different cultures. There's a, like this, this sexual teaching isn't, you know, only kept within this group, uh, Samuel Amor's Gnosis. He's, he revealed, revealed it in plain English, but... Yeah. It's in the Rosicrucians, it's in Taoist sexuality, it was in the early Christian Gnostics. They, they all talked about this. There's a lot of... We'll put together a good lecture from all the different areas of exploration if you wanted to, because there's, there's been a bunch of really interesting groups. There's a new book out right now called uh, uh, Cupid's Poison Arrow, which looks at it on a more of a psychological act side of it. But they... they uh, they study a lot of caretza, which was, you know, one of the older terms for it, or male continence, coitus reservatus. It's been known throughout the ages on all these different terms. But we can, uh, we'll talk about it more, because it is, it is really important to the teaching, so sometimes we have to get past our bashful nature and talk about what's really going on here. It, it was, that cap we're not going to be crazy. It is. Yeah, yeah. that's right. It yeah. is. Oh, it's dirty. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's the Catholic brainwashing. Sure. It is. I'll buy it too. I'll buy it. It's pretty interesting too because then when the people who are, are against alchemy or whatever you want to call it, mm, carezza, coitus reservatus, this practice, mm -hmm. carezza is the Italian word for caress, but they use that yeah. uh, in the early 1800s. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. but uh, people always want to argue that point, say it's not natural. It's not natural to do this, to have intercourse without reaching orgasm is not a natural thing to do, you know? That's what uh, alchemy is, yeah. Yeah, against nature. Yeah, but then they also yeah. jump into their beamers and drive through yeah. a, a fast food window, and the, what's natural about any of yeah, that? Right. You know, yeah. we're cooking our food, yeah. we're wearing fine silks and using technology. None of that's natural, but we don't have a problem with it until it comes to something that's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> you know? 
like everything we're doing is not natural because we we have something that everything in nature doesn't have. We have this mental body. Well, isn't the whole path um, against nature, going mm -hmm. against the forces of nature, so yeah. you could go bypass it? Exactly. It's a revolutionary. Yeah. That, that wheel of sense, sense. Sarah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's revolutionary. It just makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I found it was interesting because you know I've studied a lot of occultism and different groups being part of you know masonry and and anthropology and all those kind of things and always always for some reason when I, when I learned something here I went and f tried to find it in other places too. I was, it's just the way I was wired. Yeah. And once you learn about it here you, you can really see it in other places. I mean like Gurdjieff has these books and he talks about um, the force that, that higher beings use to coat their higher bodies and humanity they just expel it and waste it which doesn't make sense when you first read it but if you knew about this system, you're like, okay, we, will, we know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And then these books that are high, highly veiled and highly coded, they become more accessible when you know what's going on with this. So it's pretty interesting that way. Maybe we'll put together a lecture on alchemy throughout the ages and then different practical applications if you guys are making. So here's a, at the very beginning of alchemy, this is, this is the, the, the law of the octaves happening. So the food we eat and the air you know, prana that we breathe. This represents, let's say, dough. This represents dough, the first note. The digestive and absorption processes of the body transform dough to ray. So now we have this food and air. Now it gets absorbed in the body and transformed into a different form of energy. Ray becomes refined and passes by osmosis to the bloodstream where it is further and further refined. Goes through further transformations in the blood system, which would represent mi, fa, so, la. It goes through all these different transformations. Finally, the scale culminates in the sexual fluids. That's T. So that, that's, I mean, this doesn't really have anything to do with alchemy. This is just esoteric physiology, basically. And take food in. Like, we don't often think about it, but we know, like, our reproductive organs and our fluids and everything, it doesn't just happen from nowhere. You know, we're taking stuff out of the environment, transforming it in our bodies, and then we have the sexual fluids. And gnosis... He has a name for it. He calls it sexual hydrogen T12. It's what it refers to as yeah, T, like the word tea. So, and there's there's a lot of numbers, and he, he uses a lot of scientific language, which we don't get into all of that because it might confuse things before the test. But, uh, shock is needed to raise the scale to the next octave because all we've done here is taken in food and air and turned it into this, you know, sexual fluids like this, the scene with the reproductive system within the woman and this is what it's been turned into so we can either you know cultivate it or if you expel it you go back down you have to eat more food transform it again into this you know sexual fluids and that and then if it expels you gotta go back down the scale and do it again or we can give a shock so the uh, food uh, we eat slash air slash prana yeah um, the concept of the the uh, super substantial bread, uh, the, the idea like uh, give us, us our bread, our daily mm -hmm. bread, the, yeah. the idea that the bread is uh, meditation, or, or is this a different concept being um, expressed? This is sort of a different, this is a much more materialistic, physical oh, concept. Okay. Like we're talking about actual food, we're not talking about it in symbolic, we are allegory. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Like this is the physical food, you put bread in your mouth, through the body, transforms it, and, and as a result, amongst other things, obviously, right, your body uses food for everything, cell generation and growth and hair and fingernails, but it also creates these sexual fluids. The idea of like the bread and the wine, that has to do more with accumulating higher forces into it than a bread is something we will probably we will get into in the future for sure. Um, the shock needed to raise this scale is alchemy. This is what you need to raise the scale of the sexual fluids. Like before we were talking about the scale in, in terms of the work, either elimination of ego, or astral projection. Now we're talking specifically about the sexual fluids in the creation of the solar bodies. So the shock we need at this point when we have this this food turns into the sexual fluids, we need alchemy. Through alchemy and transmutation, the sexual hydrogen T12 saturates every cell of the body as it rises up the scale. So that's how you get the sexual energy to rise the, up the scale. Um, do re mi fa so la ti. So this is also, this is like, do re mi fa so la ti is more representative as it, it's not exactly specific points, so my, my fluid has risen to re, you know, or mi, you and 
pinpoint it like that. It's just the idea that it has to climb the scale, it has to get higher, it has to accumulate more power. Um, once the entire body is saturated, the sexual hydrogen begins to crystallize in the next octave. So the shock, the shock we're giving it is alchemy. <coughs> the alchemical practice, the uniting of the, the man and the woman, the white tantra. Um, the shock of alchemy and transmutation causes the sexual hydrogen to rise to the next octave. The next octave, in the next octave, the sexual hydrogen begins to crystallize the solar astral body. That's the idea of so the first scale is from food to fluids, second scale is it rises up the body up to T, and then the do you mean so like yeah, T, and then the next dough, when you get to the next scale, that's when you're starting to crystallize the solar astral body. This body is born from the same substance as the physical body, but only the procedure is different. We know that you know the sexual energy is the energy that of all growth and all birth. We know from the union of man and woman and the sexual energies, that's how every child is born, that's how everybody here was born. Now we have this, the union of man and woman again. Without this, the spilling of the fluids, we're creating, still creating life. We're creating our solar astral bodies. It's, a, it's the building blocks material for all of life, so why would it stop? Why would it stop once you hit puberty or once you get, you know, yeah, once you hit puberty, we think, okay, our sexual stuff is done until you get older. But uh, in truth, you know, we just keep cultivating. It keeps growing. We have this energy inside of us. We have to harvest it. And we have to use it. And that's what creates our solar astral body. With a continual shock of alchemy, we have to keep applying alchemy. You know, and this, this has to, alchemy has to be done in conjunction with understanding, self-observation, and the elimination of the egos. And there's two practices you can do with alchemy. I don't know how much we've talked about it, but I think you understand that you can eliminate ego or build solar bodies when you're doing alchemy. There's two things you can do. So this is this is the practice of building the solar bodies. Not in detail of how to do it, but just the idea of how it, how it works. When it comes to eliminating ego, there's another process where it takes two partners and you can only really work on one person's ego at a time, but you work together for each other. That's why it's like that's why they call it like the true love. Because now you have a partner and you're working towards them or something higher, your higher being. You're not, you know, trying to race each other to a finish line or something. Just, you know, using each other that way. So the solar astral body rises up the scale, same way that we did in the physical body. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. And then once you get the do, the scale then rises to the next octave. You know, with the, you still have to apply willpower and the shock of alchemy, and then you start to crystallize the solar mental body. This is the idea of how how the solar bodies are created. Which in turn rises up the scale to the next octave. This is the process for creating the solar bodies. And you have the castle, the bunic, the atmic, these bodies. This is how they're done through alchemy, through the elimination of ego. As we were talking about earlier, you could create them without eliminating ego, but then you're a Hannes Musin, kind of like you have an astral body you're conscious in, but now you're it's being controlled by the egos. So you're just giving the egos another outlet or another another, you know, weapon, basically. But uh, we obviously don't teach that path. We teach the path of eliminating the egos, you know, death of egos, birth of the solar bodies, and then you sacrifice. That's what I think is so funny. Um, like, so many people are, uh, are discouraged on the path of Gnosis because their ego tells them they need a partner yeah. when they, don't, they fail to recognize that uh, that that ego needs to die before they can even find their absolutely, partner. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's it's such yeah. an interesting thing. Like it people, is. they they're being they're like using their mind to yeah. try to find any reason to avoid yeah. working. Exactly. Right. Looking for it's the ego looking for loopholes. Trying yeah. to yeah. Find yeah. The, the ego says, "So what's That's the point?" Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you That's know. Smart. Exactly. That's very exactly. Smart. <laughs> when Samuel talks about it, I remember one I, I read and I thought, "Oh, this is profound," because he, he says, "You know, if you're a man." And you're on the Gnostic path, but your wife uh, doesn't want to practice alchemy. It's not her fault, and it's not something you should be projecting onto her as blaming her for it, because you're not ready for it. You have internal work you have to do. You have psychological work. You know, you have to start working on the egos. What he would, he would always say is, you know, my wife won't, won't work on alchemy with me. He said, okay, well, what ego are you working on right now that you need her help with? Oh, well, I don't really. No, well, you have to be working on an ego. You don't even need alchemy right now. You're not even working on an ego. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what are you complaining about? <laughs> so, I mean, 
if you read his books, particularly the ones that have questions and answers, he really cuts he cuts right to the point, which is a lot of stuff I like. <laughs> Makes it feel like turn the question on its head. Some some guy went way and he went get over it, basically, you know? That's like that's how I view it. Which is the most poetic. But uh, each body has within it the notes of the scale. I like how it corresponds with the seven chakras. I'm not saying that exactly, that those are exactly what the notes are, but it corresponds really nicely. And even in this picture, too, I, I like how they have the, the colors. Because you see, if you, if you look into the electromagnetic spectrum, that is the, the colors of vibration. Red is the lowest vibration, violet is the highest vibration, and then from there you vibrate out of these chakras. You know? So it, I like these kind of pictures. So they all have the do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti kind of represented in them. <clears throat> each, each body has chakras or, or their, their interpretation of chakras. And I don't know exactly what the terms are. The etheric body is called something else. The astral body is called chakras. The mental body is called... But they're basically the energy points. In the physical body, they're organs or points in the spine. But uh, each higher body repeats these notes in a higher octave. It's kind of easier to look at it that way. We're thinking mm -hmm. the physical body's one octave, you know, the astral body's another octave, the mental body's another octave, and we can really kind of we can really kind of visualize it as being higher octaves. Although I guess once you really made them all, they'd all be existing simultaneously in one space, not on top of each other like a ladder. But they are higher in vibration, frequency, and higher along the spiritual path. Higher in terms of, you know, more experience and you're further on the path. If we do not apply the shock of alchemy, or if we fall, we will begin to descend back down the scale. The fall, obviously, we're talking about the spilling of the cup, the, the orgasm, you know, if we want to say it, I want to say it bluntly. If we have a fall, you're yeah, going to say, like blunt. yeah, blunt, okay. Yeah. So if you lose the energies that you're conserving and that, that are climbing the scale, you're going to start going down. And it always says that uh, Samuel talks about it being, um, you know, related to the, 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 the fall, is how far down you go. Say if, you're working in alchemy, you're trying, but you're new at it, it's not an easy practice. If you have a fall and you're trying, it's like, ah, oh, you're not going to fall as, as far as if, say, you went back to having a one-night stand or something with some random <laughs> person, you know, full of ego and everything like that. You're not going to fall as far. But the idea, I mean, even today, there's only one real word that has survived from the hermetic tradition. And you know what it is? You know the hermetic tradition, Hermes Trismegistus? There's only one word that we use commonly today. It's a hermetic seal. And you know what a hermetic seal is that nothing can get in or out of, right? These hermetic seals they put around uh, hospital appliances and stuff. Well, that came from this hermetic tradition. And what would the original seal be they're talking about? The hermetic seal is sealing the sexual energies in and rising the mercury. That's, that's the idea. This is a picture of like, uh, Wolfgang all these really. So you have the, you know, this mercury ball and then so you, you do, that's not a great picture, but, uh, you know, maybe lead you this one for you guys too. You're working in alchemy, and it's rising up the scale of different, you know, levels. But then if you had a fall, there it goes, comes back down. And then you have to start again to get back up to that level again. I'm going to erase it because it looks like a dirty picture. That's what I said. I'm trying to draw a thermometer, you know? Yeah, that's what I'm going to I'll make a graphic. Yeah, like a thermometer. Yeah. It's supposed to be a mercury filled thermometer, and those ticks were the levels of, of uh, reached. Get your minds out of the gutter, everybody. It's not my fault you're not a good artist. Fair enough, okay. So that, that was just to illustrate the idea. If we have a fall, that's the seal. That's, what, that's the energy we're using to raise the octave. But if we're expelling it, we're having the, we're do, having the orgasm and losing all that energy that way, I mean, the energy's got to go somewhere. You've got two options. It can be expelled massively through this big energetic shock that is actually not good for your body. If you start looking into the recent studies that they're doing, particularly in this book, Cupid's Poison Arrow, they talk about the crash you have after orgasm it takes about two weeks to come back to homeostasis within the body oh, really? yeah. so it has to, it has to go somewhere it can go that way or it can go that way a lot a lot of a lot of our views of sex are based on uh, our small brain they call it the mammalian brain yeah 
today on the doctors they were talking about um, oxytocin, the good yeah. uh, feeling. The they hormone. said after orgasm it lasts five minutes and after a hug it will last about three hours. Mm -hmm. This is this is the idea. Oh, yeah. Oh, so cool. this, this, they call it the cuddle hormone. Mm -hmm. And and this Kereza particularly like these these other practices of alchemy, they don't have the spiritual component we do of trying to raise the energies, but they they, they have the, the idea of the crest, the you're not uh, making much motion or movements, but you're supposed to be caressing each other. And this this strengthens our bond mechanism with each other. And this same, I forget the hormone it's called, but you just said it. Oxytocin. Um, oxytocin. oxytocin. It increases oxytocin. oxytocin. And oxytocin? It creates, uh -huh. yeah, oh, okay. creates a harmonious relationship. Whereas if you have a relationship where you're having lots of what we would consider great sex all the time, or having all these orgasms, actually what it does is our mammalian brain will kick in. And our mammalian brain from, from the animal existence oh. will say it's trying to procreate the species so as soon as you finish one mate it has you looking already for another one so that's why you have all these relationship problems where you feel like oh she's just not the right one or he's just not the right one you know we're, we're, we're mm -hmm. having sex all the time but it's just not right for me because internally something psychological from your mammalian brain is going on saying procreate the species find another mate you know ensure that the species survives this is an animalistic nature of our, of our brain and the idea of alchemy, alchemy is, is the most highest spiritual practice of this, but Kereza and that, the idea is that it promotes bonding and this idea of cuddling and this idea that we're now pairing up and we're mating and you're doing this because there, there's differences between, you know, rubbing somebody's back because you're expecting to get something out of it, like it escalates to sex, or rubbing somebody's back because you love them or you want them to be happy. And this is the difference that they're, they're finding them. Yeah, this is the difference we're finding with this. So, so alchemy, alchemy is that, and then so yeah. much more also. I also heard somewhere um, last week on another program that they said the um, hugs were becoming the new handshake, but people aren't really comfortable because mm -hmm. everybody on the street now wants to come up and, and hug you. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, acquaintances, not really. Sure. Yeah, so. I can see that too. Everybody see, thinks it's. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not overly a huggy guy either, so I can understand where they're coming from. But I know yeah. a lot I mean, of huggy people, yeah, and they're always... Yeah. I remember once I was at, at New Year's, I think I was in Canadian Tire, and one of the teachers from the school, um, he came and hugged me, and one of the men in red came over and said, are you okay, ma'am? <laughs> you know, and, and I said, we're yeah. friends. Yeah. You know, and yeah. um, I thought he was overreacting, but then I sure. read somewhere that there was a man, yeah. um, I think it was a professor from Western, and he did something to some lady in Chocolate Drug Mart, so... Uh, I guess these people are kind of the security sure. guards are on the lookout if yeah. somebody's, you know. Yeah, it's a yeah. shame. It's a shame. And we talked about too before the esoteric personality yeah, for people who want powers and that kind of thing. They can also use alchemy as a doorway into that place. You can use alchemy and do that too. People will be like, oh, I want to practice alchemy. Oh, I just, you know, try and and they can twist it around and get all kinds of bad things out of out of doing this if you don't do it from the pure. That's why they always recommend, or someone always suggests, this between a man and a woman, preferably a married couple, because you're in a sacred bond doing a sacred act now. It's not generally something, I mean, I'm not putting labels on whatever anybody wants to do. It's just when you're in that kind of situation, you know it's, you know you're, you're have a better chance of doing it for the right reasons, as opposed to saying you, you, know, you meet some guy or meet some girls, hey, let's try this alchemy thing out real quick tonight, you know? It's like, are you really, do you really want to try it out, or are you just fooling yourself into, you know, being promiscuous? So, I mean, so the, the bond of marriage does, uh, does help that. I mean, we're not saying, nothing that someone else says is the, the judgment that you have to do or you're not going to be accepted here, but this is, if you want alchemy to work, this is how it works. We run into a lot of trouble too, you know, with uh, homosexuality and that, because they'll say, "Well, how does how do homosexuals perform alchemy?" It's, just, it's not in it's not in the teachings. Alchemy is this between a man and a woman. This is the teachings. You know, well, I don't know what this has to do with the positive and negative force. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So it's two forces. It's two forces, but it's not a moral or ethical judgment yeah, being no. made. It's just this is a specific spiritual scientific system that we've been shown through Samael unveiling it. And this is how the system works. You know, why don't you get a higher number when you subtract two numbers? It's just it's not how that system works. It's subtraction, you know. It's that kind of thing. But, but don't the, um, the homosexuals, the gays, have, um, like, hormones or something that they uh, will be more fem one will be more feminine, one more masculine? So wouldn't that kind of, couldn't they then? 
fit in with these teachings? I don't, I don't know. Mm. I've never read anything about alchemy working that way. I've read stuff about you know black tantra working that way. Because they had a man on today, and um, he had both um, born that way, yeah. and he married, got married, and then he had an accident. I think was it a car accident, a bicycle, or something. And when he had his blood tested, he was both. He had positive and negative. Like, they mm -hmm. couldn't tell if he was male or female. And he always wanted to be female. So then he, he did the, went through the whole thing. And now the woman has, uh, uh, they got divorced um, because they weren't no longer man woman. But they're, like, he calls her, it, she now has a wife instead of a husband. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it gets really yeah. complicated. Yeah, it's a complicated but, world. So, I mean, he wouldn't, I don't know where he'd fit in. Having, to say. having G, like, both. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I didn't make X this up. I chromosomes, just, I guess yeah. I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. so he wouldn't, oh, I yeah. I mean, it seems like when you look at the system this way, it makes sense why this system works, but without, mm -hmm. I mean, without moral judgment on anybody, even straight people who don't believe in this or anything, is. This is a system. This is a system we've been shown. This is how this system works. Maybe there's other systems out there. I don't know. So for me, I just, I just, oh, it just <laughs> doesn't come up very often. So it's, I mean, it comes up sometimes because people will get offended, obviously. But it's, it's well, not a still, moral judgment that anyone's trying to be. Making why couldn't it just be the same? Like they, they're still having sex, so if they don't have, you know, um, mm -hmm. the energies and the fluids and all that stuff release of that, then. Wouldn't they still be able to do the path? Yeah, if they're working with their energies, I don't know. There's nothing written about it. Like and two I, females, two I didn't, males. I didn't, uh, and Master yeah. says that uh, that's how people, you know, about vampirism. But what? Vampires. Well, va yeah. Uh, they practice this kind of uh, sexual magic. Yeah. And that's how they become vampires. Mm -hmm. So, okay. like, Count uh, Dracula, who oh, yeah. was. Uh, he practiced this kind of, of black magic, yeah. and then that's how he became. Uh, what kind of black magic? Uh, this kind of like uh, homosexual, homosexuality, like practicing oh. in the two, the, the same two poles, same gender, know, the same gender. Oh, so basically, yeah. Yeah. And oh, okay. Yeah. Um, they, they say in the teachings, uh, all, all forms of, you know, tantra that aren't white tantra will. Even if they're not black tantra, they eventually lead to that. Because oh, okay. white tantra is this exact practice. Oh. As, as seen even in the Gnostic Gospels that they found. Black tantra is the opposite practice of this, where you're you know, purposely not saving your energies to rock, raise them. But everyone generally lives in a state of gray, what they call gray tantra, where they're spilling, spilling their energies because they're not aware of it, or they don't th think it's that serious. But over time, this will degenerate into black magic or the intentional use of your sexual energies for negative purposes. The master also mentions that when he started, he <coughs> began to work with different women. Mm -hmm. There's this kind of a sexual alchemy. Yeah. And then he said, well, I don't progress, I don't ascend. Because he was working with different women, so they yeah. have to be with just one woman and in a like you said, married, bonded loving. couples. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Loving. That's how you feel. Legally it's bonded. Like a physical thing. Right. More mental. Right, because yeah. now we're, we're getting to like the more thing. etheric yeah. spiritual plane. We're not talking about just a scientific, you know, yeah. physical process of the body. We're talking about mm -hmm. subtle energies that we can't really perceive. And yeah, obviously the emotions and this kind of thing, the connection with another person, yeah. this is all part of it. It's all part of the, the recipe, basically, you can say. Oh, yeah, so where are we? Uh, here we are. Yeah, the law of octaves is a na natural law in the universe. However, there is no law of nature that will evolve you to the next octave, right? So we talked about that, too. It's the same with the work. It's the same in alchemy. You're not going to naturally just have your energies rise. I mean, they, they did it one time before the sexes split. If you remember the, the different races lectures they talked about. So I think it was the Lemurians who who's split the sexes. But before that, like the Hyperborean... The protoplasmic, they all ascended because there was their energies were contained and they contained both energies in them. Mm -hmm. Then we've been split now, so the men don't contain the, the female energy and the females don't contain the male energies. That's why they have to come together in the practice of alchemy. That, that, if you remember that from the, from, the, mm -hmm. from the root races and lectures, I think probably Lee gave it to you. Yeah, he did. 
So nature is the wheel of samsara, incessant and unrelenting. We talked about that. So this is a good picture that to me shows uh, the wheel of samsara. You know, from birth, you're getting older, you know, you die. And this happens like 108 times, right? <laughs> if you remember, is what someone else says. 108 times, and then you go back down through the animal kingdom, and then you go through the animal kingdom, devolving down to the plant kingdom, down into the infernos, you're at the mineral kingdom, and then back up again, plant, animal, human, 108 times. We're not being reincarnated, right? We're returning recurrences. We don't, we don't have the reincarnation, because that's for awakened masters. We're just subject to these mechanical laws, bringing us back and back and back. And if we don't start fighting entropy, we're raising the octaves, we're going to be stuck on this wheel. So you can kind of see how this wheel is entropy. And it comes back around. And then if you go through, <clears throat> all the numbers in my head are a little bit mixed up, but I think it's 3,000 cycles or something like that. They have a specific number. And you don't awaken, then you go back down to the infernals, to the mineral kingdom, you go through the second death, and then you, your essence is raised, but it doesn't feel like a conscious process. It feels like you're suffering because all your egos that you're so attached to are being stripped away almost violently, and you're so identified and attached to them, you feel like that's you, a part of you that's suffering. So the idea is that to get off this wheel, we have to apply the, the willpower and the energy. We have to do it of our own free will and accord, basically. We must fight the law of entropy at every moment. We have to keep moving forward in the work. Practice, meditation, transmutation, sacrifice, self-observation, and elimination. And I don't know if it's been stressed, but transmutation practices should be done regardless of whether or not you have a partner. We should be transmuting our energies. If you're working with the energies, and you're trying to conserve the energies, and you're not transmuting the energies, then you're, you're bound to have a fall, whether it's for a man maybe a nocturnal emission or something weird or a weird outburst of emotion where it's going to express itself in some way if you're just letting it pool up until it bursts. What we're trying to do is, you know, conserve it, transmute it. Conserve it and transmute it. The idea of conserving it without transmuting is dangerous because you're kind of destined for a failure there. Because now you're just sort of storing up, like trying to keep all this water in, say, a little old leather pouch that's about to burst and you're not, you know, you're not doing anything with the water. It's just going to blow up the, the pouch. You have to transmit the energies. For men and women, for men and women. We must apply super efforts to reach the next octave. We call them super efforts because if we think we're, we're applying efforts right now, I mean, we're sacrificing. We're here now, giving up a night. You know, we're thinking about it, the, the practices and reading them. But to get to the next octave, we're talking about something drastic. We need super efforts. We need to, we need to practice daily. We need to really start self-observing. Fighting entropy and applying willpower will push us to a superior octave. That's, that's what it takes. Willpower and uh, fighting entropy. Only by creating the superior solar bodies can we hope to escape from the mechanical wheel of samsara and its laws of return and recurrence, right? There's nothing uh, romantic or glorious about return and recurrence. It's not like we talk to some different schools and say, I believe in reincarnation. It's, it's beautiful. I come back and pick my mom, pick my dad, pick my family, and put, set up this whole life that I, I planned out for myself. It's like, Maybe if you're an awakened master in the Gnosis tradition, we could agree with that. But for the most part, it's return and recurrence. It's mechanical. You're not choosing. In the tarot deck, you have the fool who's walking over the cliff, not looking where he's going. That's the idea of return and recurrence. We don't know where we're going. We're not controlling it. We're not in charge of it. We're at the will of these external natural laws of karma and return and recurrence, the law of entropy and all this. So... Only practice and willpower will get you through a psychological night and lead you to the promise of a new dawn. I like this picture because it kind of demonstrates who was. Psychological night, they're putting the work in, still giving her. So it's only by doing the practice that we'll get, we'll get through this night. And that is the end of the lecture. So, let me take a short break. Or if there's any questions, we can... Yes? Oh, uh, that return re recurrence. Mm -hmm. I remember Lee said once, you come back, like, even to, you know, the same neighborhood, the same job. Like he said, he was a <laughs> Jewish rabbi, now he's teaching. So, um, is that, 
because I thought it was recar because maybe it's different people they tell you you choose your parents mm -hmm. because this is what you came to work on and yeah I I don't know I'm I'm just totally confused about so so there is no enosis there's no reincarnation it's there there is reincarnation for awakened masters oh yeah but mm -hmm. not for sure. no no one way I can get sort of behind the idea of say if people say you picked your path and you put the stuff in front of you is if the you you're talking about is maybe your divine father who you're totally unattached right now, maybe the divine being in the moment is doing that, but yeah. the you they're talking about is their egos and their personality. That That's not picking anything. That's at, that's at the whim of these forces, natural forces. And what Lee's talking about, like, I don't think he means literally the same neighborhood, because, no. but, but this, under the same circumstances, and the same dramas, and, the, and very same, mm -hmm. similar things happen until you start you know, eliminating the egos that cause them, because it's the egos that are returning to relive their fantasies and their desires. You eliminate that ego, then you won't have that problem in the next life. And you slowly advance towards more consciousness. Because I remember asking him something once, and I said, it's just, it's exactly how, I, how it happened, like the way I thought it would. And he said, well, you're just remembering. Mm -hmm. As if, you know, that had mm -hmm. all happened before. And yeah. I thought, well, well it, it just didn't It happen. has happened before, but it, like, yeah. They say the drama, the dramas and comedies and the tragedies repeat themselves. That's that's what the law of recurrence is. Return is to come back here. Recurrence is the same events happen over and over again in our lives, over a multiple lives. So, although it might even be the same people in a different form now. Maybe if you had a fight with uh, some man in this life, maybe in the next life you're a man. You have a fight with a woman it's over the same thing. So like the the situation is repeating itself. Mm -hmm. It could even be like the same soul person, like the, the same other essence and ego that you're fighting with. Exactly, mm -hmm. it usually is because the egos will search themselves out to relive from both sides. Well, I asked him that too because I said like certain men, I mean it's all there on paper, they've got all the right things, but if there's no chemistry, and I said, what does that mean? Like what mm -hmm. is chemistry? And he said, mm -hmm. well that's uh, remembering like um, someone that you already knew from the past life. Mm -hmm. Whereas... Could be. But mm -hmm. my friend thought it would just be the opposite. She said, if you knew them from the last life, you wouldn't have any chemistry with them. Like, you would love to know them again. Or something. Well, you may not go anywhere with it. If you had this chemistry, it could be the egos attracting each other because in the previous life, you didn't awaken the consciousness because these two got together maybe this life also. It's hard to speculate on every in and out of possibility, but the idea mm -hmm. is that the circumstances do repeat themselves. Well, going back to the psychological day, I remember uh, the master... Uh, he mentions in a book that when he was young, he he had a, a lifelong experience that helped helped him to overcome the the entropy, the entropy, yeah. and yeah. That, uh, that was the the experience of the illuminating boy. The, mm -hmm. It's it's like the ecstasy, yeah, the samadhi, you know, the, the shamadhi, yeah. the ecstasy. So he thought of that. He was like 18 years old, and then he practiced that. He said that that event changed his life forever. Mm -hmm. It was like a big shock for him, and kept him in a in a continuous psychological way. But what he's, did he practice? He's, yeah. He experienced the the ecstasy, the shamadi. Shamadi is a illuminated boy, really the, really high level of meditation. A high level of illumination. Very hard to explain. Oh, okay. Meditation. Like yeah, and, yeah. and everything. So because he experienced oh, okay. the totality. Mm. Yeah. So it was it's yeah. like being yeah. one with God. Yeah, it's right. something mm -hmm. like that. And that's the same idea we're talking about with the astral projection. Only astral projection would be on a much smaller scale as this samadhi would be a much larger scale, so it probably would keep you going for his whole life. If you remember astral experiences it'll keep you going forward, you know, for a while. Because it's the same idea, but it's not to the extent as what some idea would be. For yeah, those people who almost die, you know, they see the light and they, they mm -hmm. come back. Well, they've got just a whole different um, yeah. attitude about life. Like they've got all kinds mm -hmm. of energy and um, mm -hmm. they're, you know, happy and different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's well, true. Different. That's what we're trying to do is cultivate these experiences that will help motivate and change. And sacrifice, uh, it's also. Sacrifice not, not only sacrifice for humanity. We also need to sacrifice our uh, our sufferings. So uh, the master says that we need to. We we are we're always complaining about how we suffer in the past. 
-hmm. Oh, I went through this, I oh, went yeah. through okay, that. Yeah. So he says that we need to overcome these kinds of sufferings. That we, we are able to sacrifice our old habits, our bad habits, our mm -hmm. attitude, but yeah. we don't sacrifice our sufferings. Mm -hmm. So it, it's also mm -hmm. an important part of the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Another sacrifice. aspect of the sacrifice. Would it be more like uh, letting go of that, you know, or not, not really attaching yourself to, not to, attaching yourself. Yeah. Yeah, to, to your old uh, your old sacrifice? Because then you're feeling sorry for yourself, although for me I went through all this, that's yeah. all the, is, is that the kind of thing you're talking about? That kind about? of thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where you just let it go and, and just look at it as a learning experience, you have to go through it to get to the next level. And if you're still alive, just be grateful. Like yeah, that's exactly. Down what doesn't your, kill you, you know, yeah. make you stronger or whatever. You can exactly. replace that, and, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. yeah.